Hi, everyone, and welcome to this chapter of the Free Full Stack course. In this chapter, we're going to solely focus on learning Python. As you know, our backend is going to be written in Django, and Django is a framework that is built on top of Python. So a good understanding of Python is going to go a long way when we come to developing our backend later with Django. So let's just focus fully on Python and the basics of Python in this uh, chapter. We'll talk about literals. We'll talk about uh, control statements, uh, for loops. We'll talk about collections, variables, uh, functions, classes, object-oriented programming uh, as well uh, at the end of this chapter. So let's just get started with that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do some screen reshuffling in here so you see my screen better. And Let's go ahead now and open IPython. And IPython is a program that you must have now, by this point, installed in uh, on your computer, whether you have a Linux operating system, Windows, or Mac OS. If you follow the chapters chronologically in this course, uh, you should have now been able to actually install IPython. But if you haven't done that, uh, you can click on the link to this um, to the playlist for this course at the bottom of the screen is the first link in the descriptions of this video. And uh, clicking there, you should be able to see the instructions for installing IPython, PyM, Python, etc. OK? So the first concept we're going to talk about uh, are literals. So let's go ahead in here. I'm going to open up a terminal window. So I'm going to increase the size quite a lot and then type IPython in here, OK? All right, so let's talk about literals. Uh, literals in Python and uh, pretty much every programming language that has the concept of literals are pre-built values that are uh, created inside that programming language. Values such as true or false, for instance, are literals. They have specific meanings in that programming language. And uh, true, and, true and false, um, or yes or no, as they're called in some other languages, such, such as objects of C, they have special meanings to the compiler, and they represent the specific value of a specific type as well to the compiler. We'll talk about it more, so let me just show you. In here, what we can say, for instance, if we just type in here true, we can see it just tells us true. And if I start typing F in here, it will try to autocomplete it for me. And I believe in Mac, if we just press Control F, it will autocomplete that for me. So these two values are literals, as they're called. So they're predefined values of a specific type that have a very special meaning in that programming language. There are various literals that you can think of in Python. Even the value of 1, for instance, is a literal in here, or even a constant, you can call it, or the value of 2. These are numbers that have specific meanings. So for instance, if I type 2 hello, this has no value and no um, meaning to Python as a language. So you can't say that the value of 2 hello is a literal, because it has really no meaning. If I type in here, hello, you can see also I'll get an uh, error in here because hello is no literal value. However, if I type hello in here with quotation marks around it, then this becomes a literal. As you can see also, I can type hello with a single quotation mark, and that should work as well. So having a look at a few literals, you should now be able to do some experiments of your, of your own as well. So we've looked at hello, for instance. We've looked at the value of true. And you can also go ahead and do some other experiments, for instance, in here. You could type 1.2. That is also a literal. You could, uh, for instance, just say the value of 3.3 plus 2.1. And you can see, I mean, at the moment, this this on its own is not a literal because it has actually is providing an operator in between the literals. But 3.3 and 2.1 on their own are literal values. So literals, we don't have to actually explain them so much. You can just think of them as the values of specific type that have some meaning to Python as a programming language. Now, not everything uh, is a literal. So if you, for instance, mistype something in Python that you thought is of a specific type, but is not, that could that could actually be a mistake that you made, then it makes that value not a literal. As we saw, for instance, hello in single quotes or with double quotes is a literal. However, hello 
with no quotation marks around it is not a literal. Okay, so if you're getting a warning from IPython telling you that's or an error telling you that something doesn't make any sense, then you know that that, that value that you just entered is not a literal. You might also be curious about how I'm clearing um, IPython. So if I type in here, for instance, hello, and if I want to clear the screen on a Mac, I just press Command K. And I believe if you're on Linux and Windows, then you can just press Control K, and that should clear the screen for you. Now, literals, as I mentioned before, they have to have a meaning. They need to be understandable by Python. So just typing anything on the screen doesn't necessarily make it a literal. So as long as Python understands that value and it has a special meaning and a specific data type, then you could say that that is a literal. Now, uh, as I mentioned, I mean, uh, literals are important, but they're not so complicated to explain. However, they can become complicated if we're just trying to explain literals on their own without going into more uh, important subjects such as variables, because literals are actually important when it comes to assigning them to variables, as, as you'll soon see. So let's move on from literals and then start focusing a little bit more on variables, which are a little bit more fun as well to talk about. So. What are variables? Variables, I mean, if you've done any programming language, uh, if you've done any programming with any other programming language from before, you're, you're probably familiar already with the uh, with variables. So uh, variables, you could say there are names that you assign to data or values. So in here, for instance, I, I, if I say my name is Vanlad, and if I want to assign the, a specific name to this, then I will use a variable. So in here, I will say name is equal to, and then I'll say, as you can see in here. That's how you create a variable in Python. In other programming languages, such as Swift, for instance, or Rust, um, or even JavaScript, you, you use probably like uh, keywords such as let or let's mute in Rust, or, or you would say var, or you'd say const in JavaScript, for instance. In Python, you don't do any of that. If you want to create a variable and, and then you want to assign a value to it, you just type the name of the variable and then an assignment in here, as you can see, and then the value that you want to assign to this variable directly after that. So if you want to assign a value to a variable, just simply use an equal sign. So let's say age is 20 or 22. And I can just say age in here, and you can see the value of 22 being printed to the screen. You can also say uh, full name in here, and I say foobar, for instance. And I can type foo full name in here, as you can see, and the value of foobar then is printed to the screen. Now, variables in Python can be reassigned to, and even their data type can change. This is something that is called type shadowing, and sorry, this is something that is called shadowing in other programming languages such as Rust, uh, which supported not all programming languages support this feature. Python is one of the few that does support this. And uh, I will show you soon how this actually works. Uh, if you create a variable in here and say foo, for instance, you can shadow the same variable by saying name is var. You won't get any warnings or anything or any errors from uh, Python compiler in here telling you that name has already been defined. Some other programming languages, such as Swift, would give you an error. For instance, if you're in the same block of code and you're trying to create the same variable with the same name and assign a value to it then you will get an error saying that this variable has already been defined. Not Python, though. So it's an important thing to remember about Python that you can create variables and assign values to them uh, by shadowing the same variable this, with the exact same name. So you can see how that works. Uh, and also, you can change the data type uh, of a variable in Python uh, after shadowing it, basically. So in here, I can say name is foo. OK, and then all of a sudden I can say name is 10. And if I say name in here, you'll see it has the latest value that was assigned to that variable. OK, so I, I usually call this process shadowing simply because it's called shadowing in Rust. Uh, but uh, really in Python, you could just say that you're re-signing a, variable, a variable's value. So you're giving it a new value. Um, and that new value could either be of the same type as it was before meaning that it could be text or a number, uh, for instance, as it was before, or you could completely change even the data type of that value that you're assigning to your variable completely, OK? 
Now, a when you when you have a, a variable such as name in here, so if you go back in here and say name is equal to foo, okay, control F, uh, you can detect the type of uh, this variable in here. I mean, we haven't ta uh, talked really about uh, types of variables before, so let's just do that right now. Now, types, as uh, they're also called data types in some other programming language, uh, are definitions of the value that a variable contains. In here, if you look at it as just a normal citizen with no knowledge of programming language from before, you'd probably say that the type of this variable is text because at the moment it contains some text. So there is a function in uh, Python called type, and you can just say, I want the type of this name. As you can see, it will return str, which is an abbreviation for string in this case. We haven't talked really about functions yet, so I understand if you don't know anything about functions, this might be a bit confusing. Just know that you can just type uh, or write this type with parentheses, and in the middle of this parenthesis, you can write the value that you want to get the type of. So you say type of 10, and it will tell you that it's an integer. If you say age is 10, and then you say, you say type of age, it will give you the exact same result of integer, because int, is the representation of a numeric value in Python without decimals. So you've now seen str, and you've also seen int, for instance, in here. Uh, you can also have a look at, for instance, height, and you can say 1.7 or 1.8. And then you can say type of height, like this. And you can see it gives you the value of float. Now, there are different data types in Python. However, Python is not as uh, strict about data types as some other programming languages are, such as Rust or Swift. So you don't have to worry about types so often in uh, Python. And specifically, when we get later to Django, uh, you will see that uh, in a lot of cases, we just don't have to worry about data types. We just assume that a variable is of specific type based on or uh, knowledge from before of working with Django or Python. And by reading the documentations, we can then know that, OK, this parameter that comes to this function is of this type. So we don't have to actually write the type of it. And actually, this is something that is not completely unique to Python. Some other program languages also infer data types. For instance, in Rust, you can say, let uh, mutable value is 10. And this, I mean, this is not Python code, so this is Rust code. We'll get to Rust later, but uh, this way, you've just assigned a value of 10 to a variable called value. And the Rust compiler can then understand that, OK, this value is most definitely an unsigned 32-bit integer, for instance. OK? So in Python as well, almost always, we can, uh, we can let the compiler deduct the uh, and understand the data types for us so we don't have to type them manually, OK? So that's very important. But if at any point you're uh, you're kind of confused about a data type of variable, you can use this type function in order to get that data type and, for instance, print it out to the screen to get more information about it, OK? Apart from the type of a variable, you can also get an identifier for a variable. So. There is a function in Python called ID, which is just written as you'd say ID in here. So I can say ID of one, and you can see it has a specific ID. And if I say ID of one again, I get that same number. Now, if I say ID of two, you can see that it has a completely different um, integer in here. It's kind of, kind of similar though, but excuse me, at the end, it's kind of different. So um, if, if I, for instance, say in here, name is foo, and I've, if I say ID of name, you can see I get this identifier. If I say name two is foo, and then ID of name two, you can see that the ID is exactly the same simply because they have the same value. However, if I say name in here, if I say name one is foo, and then ID name one, and if I say name two is foo with a lowercase f, f and if I say ID of name two, you can see that the identifier is completely different. So the identifiers are not that important, I would say, in Python, or at least for the backend development that we're going to do with Python using Django. But it is actually still quite important in Python as a whole what identifiers are and how they're used. So for instance, 
uh, integers in Python values, integral values between minus five to and including 256, they have a constant identifier. And this is just for optimization purposes. I'm not going to go too much into it. You can actually have a look at it yourself online. But uh, if you assign value of, for instance, 100 to a variable and get the identifier of that, uh, uh, of that variable, then you'll see that its ID is the same as some other variable with the same exact value. But I actually suggest that if you're curious about this, go and have a look at this subject online. I'm not going to go so much so deep into this subject, but for um, optimization purposes, Python has decided to give a specific identifier to values in this particular range. Okay. So when it comes to variable names, there are certain rules that we have to follow, as you can see at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we can use underscores. Uh, and then we don't start our variable names with digits. So for instance, this variable name is fine, name. However, zero name is not an okay variable name. It's not accepted variable name. So I can't say van dot, for instance, in here. This will give us an error. Invalid decimal literal, okay? And also, uh, variable names can include upper and lower case um, strings. So for instance, in here, I can say name is uh, van dot. Okay. However, there are some rules that we'll later follow, especially when we also get to the Django development. But you can also type full name in here, for instance, and you can say van dot and then my full name. Okay. So this is also a completely fine way of writing Python code and later Django. Okay. Now in Python, uh, variables are case sensitive, meaning that the ver a variable named name is not the same as another variable called name, but uppercase. So if I type name in here, you'll see it, type, it prints out Nanda. However, if I type name lowercase, it prints out foo. So be very careful about that because how you name your variables is then going to affect how your program runs and executes. So sometimes you might just misspell a variable name and you'll get completely undefined behaviors in your, in your program. So uh, just keep an eye out for uh, case sensitivity when it comes to your variable names, okay? Now, Python, in a very cute way, has chosen the, uh, the snake case uh, PEP8 convention. And it, um, I mean, I say cute because Python, as a language, its name is uh, from, a, from a, a snake. And then it, as its naming convention, is also using something called a snake case. And a snake case naming convention does this. So if you want to say full name in Rust or Swift, for instance, you would say full name like this. But in Python, you would say full name with an underscore. And all the characters in this uh, variable name are lowercase. So this is what snake case is called. So you can read more about it actually online. If you just look for a PEP8 convention and then snake case Python, you'll get to the convention for variable naming in Python, which I actually, is, is a little bit of like a long document, but it's worth going through, maybe at least getting an understanding of what these PEP conventions actually are. Okay. Now that's quite actually enough about variables for now, at least we will get to know more about variables as we go on, but I don't want to bore us and talk just solely about variables for 20, 30 minutes. So uh, now that we've talked about variables, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about conditional statements because they're also quite important uh, to know about. Now, if you're already familiar with programming languages from before, uh, then you know what conditionals are. However, con if you're not familiar with programming languages before, then you probably are thinking, okay, I know what condition is, but how do I actually specify that? So in Python, there are three important words or keywords for controlling a condition. So let's say in here that uh, name is foo. What if you want to have a condition in here, say, if name is equal to foo, then I want to do something. If it is not, I want to do something else. And that's what you need these particular keywords for. If, elif, and then we also have else, okay? So let's see how we use them. Let's start by saying name is foo, okay? Now I can say if name is foo and then colon, then I say print, the name is foo. 
And then, oops, what did I do? Is the literal, did you mean, oh, sorry. I should have just used equal, equal. So I'm gonna clear this. So let's go in here. I'm gonna say equal, equal. So, and, and then I'm gonna go to the next line in here. Okay, and then let's say else print, uh, the name is not foo, okay? So have a look at the statement in here. Uh, we've already assigned the value of foo with a capital F to the variable called name. And then in here, we're saying if name equals equals foo, then print this particular um, statement in here saying the name is foo. Otherwise say the name is not foo. So if you're not familiar with, uh, with conditionals from before, I want you to please just pause this video and have a look at this syntax just quickly and see how it is written. It's with if and then a variable or if condition, then a colon uh, and then a tab, your statement, and then you can optionally have an else block in here, okay? So uh, now that we're talking about this, let's also talk about uh, the usage of these particular operators in your if statement. So as you can see at the bottom of the screen, we can use, um, for instance, equal, equal, in, is, uh, more than, or less than, more than, equal to, and not equal to. There are some operators that we can use basically in these statements, and which, we're, which we're gonna talk about soon as well. So now that we've written this code in here, let me just press the enter button. As you can see, the output of this is the name is foo. Uh, because this conditional evaluated to the true. And what that means really is if I say in here, name is foo is equal to name is equal to foo. What do you think this statement is going to do? I mean, if you just pause the video and have a look at this, what's going to happen in here is that Python's going to get to this line of code and say, okay, you're assigning something from the right-hand side to the left-hand side. So let me just go ahead and evaluate the value on the right-hand side. Then it's going to have a look at this, say, oh, name is a variable. I understand that. It has the value of foo. You're comparing name with the actual value of foo. So this is going to evaluate, this statement in itself is going to evaluate to a value of type of Boolean. Remember, if I say type in here, true, you can see it's a Boolean. So in here, if I type name is foo, let's see, uh, name is foo. You can see it evaluated to value of true because we define name is foo as this. So this particular operator, which these things are called, this is a comparison operator that evaluates the value of true or false dependent on whether this condition is met or not. So you should really get used to using stuff like this or operators like this in Python because we're going to use them quite a lot in Django as well, okay? But for now, it's quite enough that you actually just learn about, um, for instance, if, else, and l if. So let's talk about actually l if a little bit as well. So let's say name is foo, okay? So let's just say if name is foo, then let's say, actually, let's go back with lowercase, okay? Then I'm gonna say print, uh, the name is lowercase. And if you wanna say, okay, if the name wasn't this, but it is something else, then you can use a statement call or a keyword called elif, which is pretty much the shorthand for else if. Some other languages have else if, but in Python, we have elif. So in here we say elif, uh, name is foo with a capital F. And I'm going to say print, the name is, is uh, with uppercase F, okay? And then we say, okay, if none of the conditions above are met, then print, uh, I don't know, okay? So you can see now we get this uh, statement printed to the screen that says the name is with uppercase F because the LF condition was met. Name is equal to foo with a capital F. Therefore, we get to this print statement, okay? Uh, also, when it comes to uh, statements uh, that we write inside of our if statements, for instance, in here we have name foo. So I can say if name is equal to foo uh, and then if you want to add another condition in here, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, you can use the words and, or, or. So I can say in here, name it also needs to be three, the length of it. Um, sorry, name doesn't have to be three. The length of name has to be three. And then I say print as I thought, okay? 
So you can see in here, I just told Python that the name has to be equal to foo and its length has to be three characters. Leng is a spe special function, and which we haven't talked about yet about functions, but just know that it does a very special thing. It looks at the incoming variable and it just counts stuff in it. Okay, it's also useful for lists and collections, but we're not going to talk about right now about uh, collections. Okay, now uh, now that you've seen if, elif, and else uh, statements in Python, you should also know about something called a ternary operator. Ternary operator just uh, makes some pro programmers cringe because they don't like it, and some pro programmers actually go overboard with uh, using ternary operator and they just go over the limits of using it somehow. And they use it too much in that they use a ternary operator inside a ternary operator, which makes the whole operator kind of difficult to understand. So a lot of programmers try to stay away from ternary operator. And, but I think if you use it tastefully, it's completely fine. And also it depends kind of on the team that you're ending up working in and that the team can decide whether it's an okay operator to use or not. But in my opinion, it's completely fine. I understand Turner operator. And I think if you keep it tasteful, then there's no problem using it, okay? So let's have a look at how Turner operator actually works in here. So let's say that age is 10, okay? Now, you want to know if this person is an adult. So we say is adult, is. Then we say, for instance, yes, if age is more than or equal to 18 okay you can say it like that otherwise we say no so pause this video again please and have a look at how turn your operator is written in python because it's kind of different from many other languages in some languages you say is adult is um age we're going to equal 18 question mark yes otherwise no so this is how you'd write turner operator in many other languages however in python is written first by assigning the value of uh, your first condition right after the equal sign and then writing your condition uh, and then right after that typing the rest of your uh, conditions let me actually put myself also into uh, do not disturb i don't know why it was turned off automatically so now if I type is adult, you can see I get the value of no, simply because the age of 10 is not considered to be an adult, at least not in Sweden. So if I say an age is 20, for instance, and uh, execute this code again and say is adult, you can see now the value is equal to yes. So that's how turn ternary operators are written in uh, Python. And after all this talk about ternary operators, let's move our focus to functions. We've talked quite a lot about conditionals and the ternary operator. So we can now start working on functions because they're used heavily in Django as well. So it's very important that we understand how functions work in Python. So what functions are uh, is that they're a named piece of uh, code and logic. So if you have, for instance, four, five, six lines of code, and you want to group them together and also assign some sort of a name to that, then you're pretty much creating a function. So uh, functions have different properties in Python and many other programming languages. Uh, they, they don't differ so much from each other, for instance, from Python to Rust. Uh, they almost always have the same properties that you can see at the bottom of the screen. They have a name, return value, and parameters. Now, uh, in Python, a function does have to have a name. Uh, it, uh, it may or may not have a return value, and it may or may not have a, a list of parameters. So uh, here is an example of a simple function, as you can see in here. It, uh, we define functions using the def keyword in Python. In some other programming languages, such as Kotlin, we just write func, for instance, um, or some other languages, we write fun. Uh, but in Python, they're written using def keyword. So uh, you can see that we can, for instance, create a def in here, which creates a function for us. And then we can say uh, the name is length of string. And then I'm just going to complete this, OK, like that. And in here, then uh, our job is to, for instance, return the length of the given string. And so the string value in here, as you can see, is the only parameter passed to uh, this particular function. So what we want to do in here is to 
uh, be able to return the length of that uh, string. So we could in here use the return keyword uh, and then in here say length. And then we say string, I should go in here and say string value. Okay, and then press the enter key in here. So that was the anatomy of a very simple function in Python in that we have def to define the function itself. Then we write the name of the function, which usually has to be in a snake case, which we've already talked about. Then we optionally have a list of uh, parameters to pass to this function. And you can have, for instance, functions without parameter names. So you can also have in here, I can say length of foo, okay, in here, let's see. And then in here, I can just return three, okay? Then if I say length of foo and just call that function, uh, I'm getting the value of three. But if I call length of name and I say foo bar in here, um, didn't we define it as length of string? Sorry, we said length of string, so not length of name. So if I say length of string, you can see now we're getting the value of seven because foo bar with the space in between is seven characters long. Okay, so that's the simple anatomy of a function, you can pass parameters optionally to a function if that function has parameters. And also you call the function by writing the function's name and a parenthesis. So let's define another name. So let's say get full name. It's a function that has no parameters as you can see in here. Okay. And I can say in here found out Nahavandipur, which is my full name. And then I can call this function say so get full name with parentheses to get that value back. This function has no parameters in here, and hence you can invoke that function without any parameters passed in. And if you in here say get full name and then you say blah, you can see that you get an error from Python saying that this function doesn't need and cannot accept any parameters. So it's actually important to know the function signature and whether or not it requires any parameters, then you can pass those parameters in or omit the list of parameters if the function doesn't have any parameters at all, okay? Now, a function can, it can have uh, parameters that we've talked about, which are called positional arguments. So uh, positional arguments are just a list uh, of arguments that you pass to a function. And if you have, for instance, uh, a function that can take in uh, a first name and a last name of a user and put those strings together to return the full name, let's just define that function. So let's say get full name, okay? And then we say that first parameter is called first name and the second parameter is called last name in here. And our job in here is to return, for instance, uh, the first name and the last name, as you can see in here. This is, this is using some formatting in the string. Uh, as you can see, it creates a formatted string with the F prefix and then double quotes to create the string. Then it's using curly brackets in here to inject the first name parameter and the last name parameter into the string, into the formatted string with a space in between. So this is also good to know in Python that you can format your strings like this. So in here, you're, you're seeing that we're basically using the first name and the last name arguments which are positional arguments passed into this function. Then we can invoke this function using get full name, and I can say foo, and then the second parameter or argument, which is called last name, is gonna be bar in this case. And you can see the result value of this function is then gonna be foo bar, okay? So that's short about positional arguments. Now, uh, inside some functions, um, when especially when we go into Django, you'll see that we will use uh, arguments which are called keyword arguments. And these arguments, they, they're passed um, the values to that function using their name. So let's go in here and say get full name, and we say first name is, and then we say last name is, okay? You can see then, then we're getting the same data back. The, the cool thing about positional arguments, uh, sorry, the keyword arguments, is that uh, their ordering doesn't matter. Meaning that if, if we were using posi position argument, positional arguments like this, the reason they're called positional is that their position is important. In here, foo, or let's just say uh, Vandad, and then my last name, NP, for instance. This is positional, these are positional arguments simply because their position is very important. Vandad is the first name, which is going to the first name argument in the function is the first argument. And the second argument is my last name, which is going to the second argument. So the position is very important, okay? Then we're getting found.mp. 
But in some cases, especially in Django as well, you, you have functions that are quite long and you, you may want to use a, a keyword arguments in that you don't want the position of the arguments to decide which order you're passing these arguments in. So in here, let's say that for me, the last name is quite important, my last name. So if I say get full name and I want to pass my last name first, then I actually specify the name of the argument, which is called last name. And I say it's MP. And then I say first name is valid. And you can see the result will still be the same in that the first name will be processed first and the space and the last name, though the ordering that we pass these parameters in was that the last name was first and then first name followed after that. So these are called keyword arguments. So they're the same as positional arguments, though at the call site where you're calling the function, then you specify the name of the parameter equal to the data that you want to pass for that parameter. Okay. So that's short about keyword arguments. Now let's talk about default mutable argu arguments. As you can see, uh, they're defined only once per function. And they're kind of actually, um, they're kind of difficult to grasp at first. Um, let's say, let's say we create a function that you can, um, you can pass a name and this name then gets added to a, um, a dictionary or an array. And then you, we then return this array back. Okay. So let's just say def and to list append name, something like this. Okay. Then we say name and then we say list equal to or return result is an empty list. Okay. And in here we say result. Uh, let's see, result dot uh, add name, I think it's called, and then we just return the result. Okay. So in here, if I send, say, then append name, and I say name is van dot, and then I just pass it like this, let's say trace back most, append name is not defined. I thought, oh, I've defined, defined append with a, with a single piece. So we need to go and clean that up. So let's go in here and say append with a, with double keys in here, okay? Um, and then if I say append name and I say van dot in here, we can see object has no attribute out. Okay, I see, I, I think we just need to append to the list in a different way. In Python, the correct way of actually appending something to a list is gonna be using the append function. So let's go back in here instead of the add, use the append function. So, and then we execute this code again, append name van dot. As you can see here, now we took this list with a default value. So we assigned a default value to this list. And then we said, we executed this function and added the name van dot to the list. Now let's execute this function again with the name of foo and say, and see what happens. If you're, if you're coming from another program language, like uh, for instance, if you're coming from Swift or if you're coming from uh, Rust, you'd probably think that, oh, uh, well, when I call this function, the result is an empty array. And in this function, this uh, array is being modified. And the given argument of name is being appended to that empty list. Therefore, the result of this function call should actually just be foo. However, when we call this function, as you'll soon see, the name van dot is still present in that list. And this is because um, default arguments, mutable arguments are default for functions are defined only once for the entire program, meaning that Python is keeping a hold of this result between the executions of this function. So it's being mutated per function call. And this may or may not be the desired effect. And this is only happening because this value is mutable. So it usually doesn't happen if you're using strings, for instance, as default values or integers as default values. It's specifically happening because we're using a list in here, which is a mutable data type. And there's a workaround for this. So if you want, for instance, every time that you call this function for the result to be an empty list, then there's a workaround for that. And I'll show you in here. There's a keyword in, in Python called none, which is really important. And then we're going to use it a lot, actually, when we get into the Django part of uh, our backend development. And you need to know about none. It's kind of like undefined in, um, in JavaScript. 
or you could say it's almost like null in some other programming language. It's not exactly like null, but something like that. So what we can do in here is go ahead and define this result to be none by default. And then inside the function itself, we check if the result is none, then we assign it to an empty, uh, empty list. So let me show you how that would work. Let's go back in here and we say result this time is actually none. And then we go inside the function, we say if result is none, result is equal to an empty list. Okay. Then after that, we append to the result and then return the result. So this time around, if we invoke this function and say append name vandad, we get vandad. If we then call the same function with foo, you can see that we only get foo back. So really all you have to do is just to make sure that your result, which is going to be the list, which is empty by default, and it is set to none uh, in the function declaration itself. And inside the fun function implementation, you set it to a correct value when it is none. Okay. So now that we've talked about these, we need to also talk about the return statement. And return, as you've, as you, as you've seen already in here, is a way for you to return a value from a function. So um, it's also a way for you to exit a function. So you could say, uh, let's, let's go in here and define a function. Is my name pretty? OK, this is a function that looks at uh, names and uh, that you pass in here. If that name is more than uh, one character long, for instance, then it says the, that your name is pretty. Otherwise, it doesn't do anything. Okay, so let's just say that if um, if name if length length of name is less than uh, two, meaning that it's one, for instance, or zero, then just return. Okay, and then in here we say return. Uh, your name is very pretty. Okay. And then we can say, is my name pretty? We call that function with just the string of a, we can see then we're not getting any values in here, uh, returned from the function. However, if you say a B, then we're getting this particular string. So what happened here is that when we call this function with the value of a, which is just a single character, we went into this, um, uh, if if statement, we check the length of the name. In this case, it will be one. One is for sure less than two. Then we're just hitting a return statement. So uh, return is a keyword for returning a value from a function. However, if it is just written as return with no return values in it or after it, then you're literally exiting from a function. So this is a way to quickly escape from the execution route inside a function without you having to actually write any other statement before it because, uh, or sorry, or after it, because some other developers may develop this function like this. They would be in here saying just pass else return this because you could also do this and pass as a keyword in Python as well, meaning that just don't do anything. So you can see in here, if length of name is less than two, don't do anything, otherwise do this. But some other developers may just say return in here and then put this return in here and then remove the else. And some other developers may just say if the length of the name is more than one, then return this statement. And otherwise, don't do anything. So it's really dependent on how you like to write your code. And a lot of programmers just try to do as little as possible, which I'm actually co completely behind. I, I'm, I believe the less code you write, the better but also you have to strike a good balance in, on readability versus contra how many lines of code you're writing. So if by writing less number of codes, uh, line, lines of code, uh, your code is getting less complicated, then I think that's actually the best way to go about writing uh, software in general. So um, as we've talked about it, just let's uh, focus also a little bit on mutability of data. Functions can change uh, mutable data that is uh, either passed to them as a parameter or an argument or there, uh, when that mutable data is in the scope of the function. So just keep that in mind because um, it's very important how functions, how fu function calls can actually um, change the data inside your program, even if you don't pass that argument to the function. 
Okay. All right, great stuff. So that's for now enough about functions. Uh, let's now talk a little bit, little bit about keywords in Python. Okay, then let's move on to keywords. Now we've already talked a little bit about keywords and we've actually seen them in action. So there's not really so much to talk about when it comes to keywords, but it is still quite important to understand what keywords are specifically in Python. So uh, keywords are, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, words that have special meaning to the Python programming language itself. So things such as if, or def in here, you can see these are considered to be keywords or important words for Python. They have special meanings to Python. When the uh, Python programming language sees these keywords, it can prepare its context for what's about to come. So for instance, uh, right after def, it expects a function name. So that's just how it is done in Python. So you can't, for instance, go ahead and say, uh, def one, two, three in here, because then you get an error. In here, Python is expecting a valid syntax to follow this keyword. You can see in here, uh, if I say in here, def, uh, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, is equal to one, two, three. So you can't have, for instance, a variable called def in Python and assign a value of one, two, three to it, because def is a keyword, OK? There are other keywords also available in Python. As you can see, it's a, a keyword of not yield for try return raise. And also we have import. So these are important uh, keywords in Python and you can't just use them for variable names, at least not so easily, okay? And if you're uh, curious about a list of all keywords in uh, the Python programming language, there is a link at the bottom of the screen. You can go ahead and have a look at uh, various keywords available in Python. Now, that's enough for now about keywords because keywords are not something that you will really focus on when it comes to programming languages. Keywords are part of the language. And then as you learn the language, then you learn about the various keywords as well, unless you're specifically out for learning the keywords, in which case you're more than welcome to have a look at the link that I've provided uh, at the bottom of the screen, the previous uh, label. So that's great stuff about keywords. Let's go on now and talk about classes. Now, as functions are named pieces of logic, classes are named groups of pieces of logic. So you will have, for instance, you may have four or five functions that are doing something very similar to each other or something related, um, and then you want to group them together. That's how you then get a class. A class is... Uh, an entity in uh, Python and many other programming languages that have support for classes. And you create a class with a name and you can also then extend another class, which is called subclasses, subclassing. We'll get to that later. And uh, you can inherit the logic from your sub a super class and you can have then functions, variables, properties inside your class as we'll talk about them soon. So, um, for classes, we will have the ability to basically specify a name for uh, every class as well in Python. And for variables, we saw that we're using snake case in that we write our variable name name like this. This is snake casing. However, in Python, when it comes to creating your classes, you basically are using Pascal casing, which is like this. It's like the first letter of every word is uppercase and the rest of the letters in that word or in those words are lowercase. So if I wanted to say that I have a class called um, my uh, my person, then I would write it like this. Or uh, a class called police officer, then I would write it like this. So every first, so the first character of every word inside the class name has to be uppercase and all the other characters need to be lowercase, okay? So, Let's go ahead in here and add a simple class uh, to our application. So what we want, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, is just a, a person class. And we are using the um, class keyword, as you can see. And then we just say person, OK, in here. And then what we're going to do in here is just to have two properties for our person class. So we want a first and a last name property. So the way to do that in Python is, I mean, some programming languages like JavaScript, then you have to use this and then assign those properties. 
or like with uh, Kotlin, you'll have a private uh, value inside your class. So you would just say like private val uh, in here, uh, blah. And you would say, this is a string for instance. And that, that would be in Kotlin. But in here, you would have uh, two properties in here, which is first name, as you can see, let's just say foo, and then last name bar. Okay, so that's how you would create a simple class in Python with two properties, namely first name and last name, okay? So you don't have to type this or anything special, just start your class and then write your properties. And you can also assign, uh, assign names to those properties, okay, and values. After you created your class, then you wanna create a copy of it or as it's also called instantiated. So you wanna create a new instance of that class because this class is just a package of code. And then every time you want to use this class, you need to create an instance of it. So if, if in here I write person.firstName, you can see that I get foo. And if I say person.lastName, then I get bar, okay? So let's go ahead and create an instance of this uh, foo bar in here and let's see what actually happened to those properties that we created so let's say foo is a new instance of person okay and i say foo first name so you get foo now if i say foo that first name is foo with capital okay and then i say foo first name you get foo like that back but what happens then if i say person dot first name you'll see then I get foo back. So it's not the same as foo's first name. So what happened in here is that person had a property called first name and a person had a property called first name. And then when we created an instance of person, we could change that particular instance's first name property to be an uppercase foo. And then the person's first name property stayed the same as foo. Now there's other ways of creating properties for classes as you'll later see inside constructors, but we're not gonna talk about that right now. So we're just gonna uh, leave this example as it was like this, okay? But just know that this is how you can create simple properties for your classes. Okay, now let's go ahead and talk a little bit about methods in uh, classes. Methods are simple functions that are available in classes. You can write different functions in classes and they follow the same uh, lines of rules for functions as we've talked about. They need to have def uh, as a prefix to define them as a function, then a name, um, and which is going to use camel casing um, naming convention and an optional list of parameters. As you can see, we're going to go ahead and create a function in here called full name, whose job is to return the full name of a person. So let me do a clearance in, in here a little bit. And let's actually clean that and go back to how we define our person class in here. Now we want to create a, a new function in here. We're going to call it full name. Okay, as you can see, this is this is the way you need to create your functions inside classes in Python in that the first parameter that is passed into every function inside a class is called self. Now this may be a little bit of a an alien uh, subject for you uh, or a, an alien like con uh, concept for you that, that you think, okay, why is self being passed in here? Am I, am I going to pass self myself as a parameter? Uh, but don't worry about that. What happens in here is that inside a class's definition, you may need access to the properties inside this particular instance of person, okay? And that's how you access them using self. So you say in here, I wanna return f self first name and then self last name as you can see in here, okay? So if I then press enter in here, and if I say, <clears throat> excuse me, foo is a person, and if I then say foo dot full name, you can see that I get foo bar back. And, and in here, what's happening really is that when you call full name on foo, and uh, what Python is gonna do is, is gonna replace the self instance automatically with the instance of foo. So it's actually gonna pass foo in here for you. So this is a rule that you need to know about in Python. When you have functions inside your classes, just instance functions like this, the first parameter almost always has to be self, okay? Depending also on what type of function you're creating, as you'll, as you'll see later, there are functions that whose first parameter doesn't necessarily have to be self, okay? 
but uh, you can pause the video and have a look at this classes definition just to get an understanding of how you can create classes in Python with properties and how you can access those properties inside the class itself using the self keyword. Okay. Good stuff. Now that we've talked about those, let's go and talk about the init method in Python. Now in Python, we have an init function, which in other programming languages is called a constructor. You also have init functions, for instance, in Swift, you have them somehow also in JavaScript, and they're, they're pretty much everywhere. When it, calls, it comes to classes, there is a special concept, uh, which is called a constructor or an initializer, is a special function uh, that will be called automatically by the programming language itself by the runtime whenever you create a new instance of that class. Let's have a look at how this actually looks like in Python for our person class. So let's go in here and, and then do a def init in here, as you can see. So what's happening in here is that underscore underscore init underscore underscore is a special kind of function in Python, which is called a constructor. It automatically gets called when you create an instance of person. And then the first parameter to this is actually the instance of this person, which is being created. And also you can add uh, positional arguments in here. For instance, in this case, we have a first name and a last name. So what we're going to do then is to go ahead and store this incoming first name and last name inside the instance of this person. So let's just say first name is first name and then last name is last name. Let's see if I can type it as you can see in here. So using self, then we're assigning these two uh, positional arguments to, to the first name and the last name um, uh, properties of this class. OK, so. Uh, just keep this in mind, def underscore underscore init is also quite important in Django when we get to it. So when we're creating specific classes, for instance, for our models, we may want to override the init functions, though it's not something that we often do, but it is actually useful to know both in Python and Django what init functions and constructors are. Okay, so now that we've done this, let's create a person. So I'm just going to see P is person. OK, you can see the first name is Vanford and last name is Nahavandipur. And I'm just going to press Enter in here. And then if I say p.firstname, you can see the value is Vanford. And then p, let's go in here and clean, clean the screen. And then p, last name, then we're getting Nahavandipur as my last name. So this is how you would create a class with a constructor uh, or the in, in its function, as you can see, underscore, underscore, init. OK? so. That's enough about the init function. We have a lot more to talk about, so we can't we can't just uh, talk about the init function for the entire uh, chapter. So let's go ahead and use the um, now str function. And if I go in here and create a new def in here, let's say def, and then str. As you can see, this is also a special function using which you can create a string representation of your of your person class. So in here, let's go ahead and, and say we return uh, our first name and last name in here. I can say uh, I am a person and then a comma and then using self first name and then self last name in here. Okay. So if you go to the end of this and we create a P person, okay, just like this, as you can see. Okay. And then we say P uh, and then we say print P. And see that we get that particular string printed to the string, uh, sorry, printed to the console. So what uh, that str function is doing in here is just creating a string representation of your class. So when you're using print statement to, for instance, do poor man debugging later, and then print a version or print the representation of your class instance to the console, then Python internally is going to call this underscore underscore str underscore underscore uh, function. And uh, it's just going to grab its return value and then print it to the screen. OK, so that's for the str uh, function. We also have a wrapper uh, function in here. Let me see if I can go after this. So uh, wrapper function is it's kind of like a short way of saying representation. And um, if, for instance, uh, in here, I just type uh, P. You can see that it says P is coming from the main module and it's an instance of the person class at this memory address. So it's not very useful. But if I say print P, uh, Python is calling the str function and returning its uh, value to us and printing it to the console. 
However, you can also have control over what Python prints when you actually just type the name of your variable, which is an instance of the person class. So you can change the value that is being printed here as well using the repr function. So if you go back to our uh, class person in here, we can define a special function, repr, okay? And then in here, you can say return I am a person, okay? And then if you go and create an instance of your person class again, let's go ahead in here, P person, okay? Actually say P is person, okay? And then if I just type P in here, you can see then I'm getting the value of I am a person printed to the um, to the console. So you've learned about constructors, wrapper, you've learned about the SDR function self keyword inside classes. You've uh, also uh, learned how to pass values to a constructor or the init function of a class and how to create instances of classes in Python. So I would say that is quite enough uh, actually talking about classes in Python. We're going to talk more about them later, but there's so much more to talk about. So we should move on as quickly as possible. Now, let's talk about enumerations. Um, enumerations in Python, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, they're uh, kind of like classes, but they create, uh, they group similar objects together. Now. What that means really is that let's say that you have a class of um, a class called animal, and then you want to say uh, every animal has a type. It's either a rabbit or a dog or a cat. Let's just say you have three animal types. Now, how do you represent these animal types? You could say that you have to pass them as a string, for instance. So every time you create an instance of this person, then you have to say, okay, what kind of an animal it is? Is it a dog or is it a cat or is it a rabbit, for instance? However, uh, if you allow the user to pass these values in as a string, for instance, then nothing stops the uh, programmer from calling an invalid value, uh, passing, for instance, a dinosaur or something in, <laughs> maybe. So for those cases, you may want to create an enumeration, an enumeration that represents the acceptable values for the animal type. And in that enumeration, then you can say that, okay, I have three acceptable values for this enumeration class, dog, cat, and rabbit. Then, so in that way, you as a programmer can take control over what values are acceptable values for animal type. So there is documentation for enumerations that you can uh, go and have a look at. I always suggest people learning a new programming language to go ahead and read the documentation really for all these basic bits and pieces of the programming language or the building blocks of the programming language. So if you're interested in enums, um, you should hopefully go ahead and have a look at this documentation before moving on with this chapter. So the way this works really is for enumerations to actually work, you need to import them. Importing is a way for you to bring in code into your current context uh, to the current program without you actually having to write that code necessarily. In this case, enumerations are pieces of code that the Python uh, programming language brings with itself, but it's not included in the standard library in, in a sense that is already imported for you. So you have to import it and ask the, the, the programming language to, to borrow pieces of code that has already been written for you using the import keyword, okay? So what we're going to do, we're going to say from enum, which is a module import. Actually, we, we don't want auto, we, we, actually, we just want enum. So enum with a capital E is the name of the class that we're going to use. And enum with the, cap with the lowercase e is the name of the module. So this enum class is available in the enum module. And this is a, a way to import a specific class, for instance, from a specific module. From module import class, OK? So after you've done this, you can just type enum in here, you'll see that enum is it, it, now available in our current context. So Python understand what this is. So if you then want to define your animal type in here, for instance, then the syntax for it, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, you say class animal type. And then we're going to go in here and say it's of type enum. OK, so this is how in Python you create a, a class that comes from another class. So this enum is a class that uh, is available. Uh, someone or some people have written it. 
your animal type it's going to be of this type so this is how you inherit the enum class okay so you say class my class and then i'm going to inherit the code from this guy so i'm of this type all right good stuff now now that you've done this uh, what, what you need to do then is to define your cases. So you want to say, for instance, I have a dog, a cat, and a rabbit. So you can say dog, and in here you can see that I'm assigning the value of auto to it. And if I just type dog, cat, rabbit, and go to the next line, you can see then we're getting a lot of errors. Actually, it's important to have a look at these uh, errors and have a look at what they actually mean. You can see it says name dog is not defined. And this is, I mean, I've always thought that this error is not so self-explanatory what it actually means. But really what is happening in here is that these cases, these dogs, cats, rabbit cases, they don't really have any meaning to Python as a program language. They're not keywords. They don't have any values. So in some other program lang languages like Swift, you would define an enumeration exactly as we actually did in here without having to specify any values for them. But in Python, you kind of need to tell Python what these values actually are. So in order to do that, we need to go ahead and import, for instance, actually without importing. Let me show you without importing first. So let's say dog uh, is one, cat is two, and rabbit is three. Okay. So now all of a sudden those errors disappear. So what happened in here? By assigning values to every case in your enum, uh, enum class, um, you're making them meaningful to Python. So if I, if I say here enum type dot dog, you can see that I'm getting animal type dog with the value of one printed to the screen. So this is how you make an enumeration case by typing its name as completely uppercase, and then, which is kind of like the preferred way of doing this. And then a equal sign, space, equal sign, space, and then the value that you want to assign to it. And this value doesn't necessarily have to be integral. It doesn't have to be an integer. You can go in here and say, dog is my dog, okay? Cat is your cat, and rabbit, uh, who, who owns this one? So, and if I say animal type dot dog, I get my dog back in here. So these values can pretty much be any literal that you want to assign to these. Now, there is another thing that you need to know about enums is that in a lot of cases, you don't actually want to assign values to them. You want Python to assign values to them. So in this case, for instance, the way we'd written it before in here, in here, we didn't actually care about the values for these things. We just wanted to define them. And this is a very valid way of thinking. And for that, Python has created a special import that you can do in here. From the enum module, you can import something called auto in here. OK? And what auto actually does is a function that can automatically assign value to your enum cases. So if you then go back to this animal type, the way it was before when it had no values, then you can see in here, you can assign these to the auto function, okay? And then if you say animal type, animal type dot dog, you can see you're still getting the value of one in here. Now, if all of a sudden you change your mind and you go in here and say, uh, I want to have an elephant, and then you say auto again, uh, like this, and then you say animal type, dot elephant. Did we type elephant with a PH or an F? I don't remember uh, how was the, how was the actual right way of writing it in English. So uh, in Swedish, we say elephant um, with that, which is an F. So I'm assuming in Swedish, uh, in English, it's P with PH. But now you can see that an elephant is uh, assigned the value of two, and then cat should be then three. So what auto does is that it, it automatically, as its name indicates, it automatically assigns values in an ascending order to the enumeration cases for you, so you don't have to worry about that. So this is a common pattern that you'll see in Python and sometimes also in Django, assigning specific values to your enum cases, and they have to have specific values as well, OK? So now what you want to sometimes do is to see, for instance, if a specific instance of your enum is coming from uh, an uh, a specific enum itself. So let's say dog is animal type dog in here, OK? So let me complete this. And then if you type dog in here, you see it comes from animal type dog. But if you just get dog as a parameter passed to 
a function, you won't know what value that is. So there is this very important function in Python called is instance. And you can say is instance, uh, sorry, is instance, uh, I believe. Okay. Then you can say dog is, is it of animal type? So you see in here, it says, okay, is dog of this type, animal type? Then it says true. Okay. I can say is dog of type str? It says false. It's not a string. Okay. If, if, if I say in here, is it an integer? It says false. Though, if you type animal type, uh, animal, actually, let's go back to our animal types, how we define them. You can see dog is an auto, which by default becomes an integer. But if you actually check whether a dog is an integer or not, then it says false. Because when you've defined your animal types as an enum, then they're an enumeration. Doesn't matter what every instance or what every case of that enumeration has for a value, those values are associated with enum cases, but the enums, enum cases themselves are of the, of the enum type. So that's why is instance is saying this dog is not an integer, though dog has an integer value. Okay, so it's a very important distinction. However, if you say is instance dog animal type, then it says, yes, it is true. Okay, so keep uh, keep this is instance function also in your in your mind because it's quite important actually to remember that also when we later go to Django development we're sometimes going to use this is instance function okay so um, enumerations are also hashable values in the, and what that means really is that uh, we haven't actually talked about collections yet and we're going to talk about them soon but um, you need to know that uh, you can create key value collections in Python and you can actually use enumerations as hashable values inside these collections. So let's actually create a simple collection in here. I'm just going to call it C in here. And let's say um, first name, first name as the key. Okay. And then for the um, value of that first name, we're going to say fluffy. Okay. And I'm just going to close this. And if I say C in here, you can see it says like that. And if I say C first name, it doesn't actually print that because we have to do it like this. C first name. Uh, it says fluffy. The value is fluffy. Now we want to say, okay, this is saying the first name is fluffy, but also we want to say type. Then we can in here say animal type dot dog. Okay, like this. And if I say C type you can see then it's gonna return the animal type dog for us. So uh, we haven't talked about uh, collections, hashing, stuff like that. So this might actually look a little bit like uh, uh, alien to you right now, but just know that by saying something is hashable, it means that we can actually put it inside a collection, for instance, using these curly brackets, which create hash maps for, for us. But we'll talk about hash maps actually later. So don't worry about that. Just know that, uh, uh, enums can actually be used inside uh, maps or hash maps as they're called as well. Okay. Now, enums, you can access, um, as you can see, if I go in here and say animal type dot dog, this is one way of grabbing a hold of uh, the dog instance inside that enum. But you can also say animal type and you say dog in here. It also grabs the same instance for you. Okay, and also you can go in here and say animal type. I wonder if we can actually say one in here uh, and it doesn't return a value, no. So uh, yeah, with dog, we can access it basically. So you can either say dot dog in here, or if you have the string representation of that same enum value, you can also type it inside uh, square brackets in here, okay, like this. Or you can say animal type. All right, so th these are two ways of accessing the same enum value, all right? Now, every instance of your um, enum cases, so let's say dog is animal type dog, it has two important properties, as you can see at the bottom of the screen. One is name and the other one is the value. So if I say dog name is actually dog, which is the enum name itself, and then also has a value of one. So this could also be useful in some cases if you're, for instance, creating collections with your enum cases, you may want to access their names and values separately. So just know that they have two properties, namely name and value as well. Okay. 
Um, now it's coming to auto uh, value creation uh, or va value assignment for enums. We've already talked about this, so we don't have to talk more about it. Just know that you can import, uh, import, let's see, from enum import auto, which then is a function which you can use to assign values to your enum cases. So if you go back up, let's see if you can find it here. Um, that's how you assign values to your enum enumeration cases using the auto function, okay? Now, uh, we're not going to go so much into detail about this particular case. I was actually thinking of showing you an example of this, but I don't think it's so necessary for this chapter, to be honest with you. We have more important things to talk about. But auto um, is a function that works quite, actually, it's very well thought out. And it is, you can actually overwrite the way that auto works. And um, it's a little bit complicated to do that work, but as you can see at the bottom of the screen, you can create a, a special enum um, that overwrites a special function. As you can see, it's called generate next value. And using this particular function, you can define how auto generates its uh, auto generated values. Inside enumerations, auto by default creates the values of one, two, three, four, et cetera, et cetera. But you can actually override that. So you can say, for instance, the first value should start from zero, or the first value should start from minus one, or the first value should be a spe special string. Okay, so you can actually override that. And if you're curious about that, you can go ahead and read the documentations for Python and spe specifically the auto um, function and how you can create your own automatically generated values for enumerations. But let's not focus on that for this chapter, at least. Now. When we get to creating our uh, Django backend, we're most probably are actually going to use some enumerations. And those are going to be used also for like the data that we store in uh, Postgres, so, which is our uh, database. So keep enums in mind. Uh, classes, functions, and enumerations are very, very important in Django for backend creation. So I would really suggest that you spend some time in IPython uh, or your favorite environment to play with them, learn how they work, how you can extract data from them, how you can create new functions inside classes, and how you can create new functions generally with different parameters. So they're very, very useful. OK, so that's enough right now about enumerations. So let's go ahead and focus on collections now. All right. so. When it comes to collections, there are different types of collections in Python and many other programming languages for that matter. In Python and Django, you'll see that we'll actually use lists, we'll use dictionaries or dicts, and also we'll use tuples. And these concepts are actually available in programming languages like JavaScript, and they're available in TypeScript, uh, Swift, Rust, and many other languages. Collections are used, as their name indicates, to collect and store series of rather related objects. They don't necessarily have to be related in the content that they store, but at least the data types are usually related to each other. So we're going to start by actually talking about dict or dictionary. So a dictionary is a collection with keys and values. And there are lots and lots of uh, pieces of data out there even today, that are keys and values that you may actually not think about them. For instance, if you bought anything online and you're trying to fill, fill out your um, checkout details, such as your first name, last name, address, payment information, that information could be represented with a dictionary or a dict, as Python calls it. So first name is the key, and the value for that, for instance, would be your first name. Last name, age, for instance, 22 or something. So these are keys and values, and they're uh, easily stored inside a Python dictionary. There's documentation for dictionary, which I really suggest that you go ahead and read about. There's lots and lots of information online about what you can and can't do with dictionaries, different operators, uh, different operations that you can perform on them, and where they're useful and where they're not useful. So I highly suggest that if you're trying to learn about Python dictionaries to go ahead and read the official documentation as well. In Python, you create a dictionary using curly brackets. So in here, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, we're creating something called my map. 
And also dictionaries that are called maps or hash maps in some other programming languages as well. So uh, if you want to um, learn all these terms, I'll throw them out every now and then uh, throughout this course and also this chapter. So you get used to them uh, kind of being used interchangeably. So let's go ahead and, and use actually a my map in here. And let's say my map is equal to one and two. You can see there are two keys in this map. The first key is one, and the second key is two of type string or str. And then the one key has a value of one, and then the second key, which is called two, has the value of two. They don't necessarily have to be in this order. They can, for instance, be first name or first name, however you want to write it in here. So for now, it's just called one and two, as you can see. Okay. So this is how we would create a map. You can also create a map that is empty, just like that. And then if you print it out, you can see it's an empty map. However, if you go back in here and create this map, then you should be able to extract data from that map. So for instance, if you want to extract the value of one from here, you can extract it using the key for that value. Okay. So here is basically how you would extract the value of one from my map by using its key, which is a string of one. So if I say my map, then you would put uh, square brackets in front of the map, and then you would say one. So you're telling Python that you want to extract the value for this particular key, and then you get that value. Similarly, you can say uh, you, that you want the value of the key, the value associated with the key of two. However, if you specify a key that doesn't exist, you can see that you'll get an error in here saying that there is a key error. I don't know, actually know if you can see that error. Now you can see it. You can see that a specific error was thrown. We haven't talked about exceptions yet, but this is an error that Python itself is throwing, telling you that this particular key doesn't exist inside this map or dict. Okay. So if you want to access uh, the value of a particular key inside a dict in Python, you would use uh, square brackets and then you would provide the uh, key inside uh, inside uh, quotation marks in here because it's a string. But for instance, if we went in here and said uh, my map one two, and then we would create, for instance, a, a third key uh, that is ten, and we would give the value of ten in here. Okay, you can see that's also acceptable. And then if I want to grab this value of ten, I would use this key which is a digit of 10 in here, digits, you can see then I can read its value. So square brackets, the name of the key, whatever it is, whether it's an integer value or a float value or a string value, and then you will close your square brackets using which you will get the value for that particular key, okay? So if you want to find out whether a specific map has a specific key inside it, you can use if something in that map. So as you can see at the bottom of the screen, so if you go back to the creation of this map again, I say if um, one in, let's actually go in here, if one in my map, okay, then we say print, yes, it includes one. And then we say else, print, no, it does, no, it doesn't include one. Okay, so you can see now that we're getting this uh, command or this string printed to the, to the screen saying, yes, it includes one. Because if you are looking for a specific key inside a map, you can use the if in uh, syntax, if that key in my map. And similarly, you can also use if, for instance, xxx is not in my map. You can say print uh, as expected. Okay, oops. Uh, not in, actually, I should say, uh, not is not in, it's actually is, is, um, we don't need the is syntax in there. So if something not in my map, okay? So let me press enter in here, and then we can see the value as expected printed to the screen. You can't see it, so I'll just print it one more time. So now you can see that. So the syntax is if key in or if key not in. Okay, so that's how you can search for a specific key inside a dictionary, all right? So also, if we say that this is our map, uh, if you go back in here, if you want to grab the value of a specific key, let's say my map, and we saw that we could say, for instance, one or two, 
However, if there was a key that didn't exist, so let's say XXX, then we got a key error in here, okay? If you don't want to get that key error and you just want to extract the value of a given key from your dictionary, and if that key doesn't exist and you want to default to a certain value, then you can do, as, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, so we say mymap.get, and then you specify your key, uh, for instance, XXX in this case, which doesn't exist. And then you can provide a default value in here. So let's say one, two, three. Okay. You can see now the value of one, two, three is printed to the screen. Okay. And if you don't provide one, two, three in here, then you don't get any values printed to the screen. So get is a good function uh, on uh, dict in uh, Python if you want to, for instance, provide a default value. And this is quite useful as well in uh, Django because sometimes when you're serializing and deserializing objects that are read and written to a database, for instance, you may be working with maps or dictionaries. And in there, you may want to use the get function in order to get the value of a certain key if it exists or get a default value. So it's quite useful, I would say, this particular function. If you, for some reason, need to get the keys and values inside a map, then you can use, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, the keys and values functions on that map. So let's go and say mymap.keys. And you can see 1, 2, and 10 are the keys. And then you can say mymap.values as well. Then you get the only values, basically, out of uh, the, uh, the dictionary. So this is also quite useful. Python also provides uh, a mechanism for merging two dictionaries. So let's let's say um, my map, uh, my values are these, and then your values. Let's see, your values are these. Okay, so then we have two dictionaries in here. Uh, the first one includes the keys of one, two, and the, the second one includes the keys of three and four with the associated values for each key. Then if you want to um, uh, merge these two dictionaries together so that you can create a dictionary that con contains all the keys from both of these dictionaries, you can use a pipe. So you say my values pipe your values. Okay. Oops. Uh, your values. What did I type? I mistyped it. Values like that. So you can see now the pipe in here merged the first and the second dictionaries that we provided in here to create a third dictionary that includes all the keys and values from both dictionaries. Now, you also need to know um, that dictionaries, they're hashable, meaning that if I say, for instance, my values in here, let's say my values equal to this, and what happens if you provide a key uh, in a duplicate manner. So let's say one is provided twice in this case, okay? So let's say again. And if I say my values now, you can see uh, the key of one is having the value of again, which is right here. But we also provided the key of one with the value of one. But that key was overwritten by a key with the same name, which was provided later. What this means is that the keys inside your dictionaries inside Python, as it is the case with other programming languages, they need to be unique. If you provide, for instance, if I say my values with the key of one is 1000, and if I type my values now, you can see the key of one now has the value of 1000. I don't get another key in this dictionary that says one and 1000, and it keeps the older keys that said one as well except whenever it sees a key of one, for instance, in here, it replaces the previous key if one exists. Otherwise, it inserts that key inside the dictionary. So this is very important to understand. And this is something that is called hashing, meaning that every key that is presented inside the dictionary has a specific in integer representation, which is this hash value. As long as the integer is the same as another integer, that key will get replaced. So. Um, something we'll talk more about later, but just know that a, the same key cannot be presented inside a dictionary twice, okay? It's either no, no, uh, basically either that key doesn't exist in the map or, or the dictionary, or it does exist and it only can exist once. Yeah, so it can't be presented twice or three times, for instance, okay? Um, 
As I mentioned, uh, dictionaries are really useful when we get to Django because we'll be serializing and deserializing, deserializing objects quite a lot and passing objects from one function to the other, for instance. So it's very important that you understand how dictionaries work in Python and later Django. But Django dictionaries are not anything special. They're the same as Python dictionaries. So uh, there is not no such thing as Django dictionary, except dictionary is or dict is a data type that belongs to Python, and Django is going to be using Python dictionaries. So as long as you learn how Python dictionaries work, then you're good to go also on the Django side. OK? Good stuff. Now, we talked about dictionaries. Let's talk about lists as well, or arrays, as you might know them in some other programming languages. So arrays are used to store data in a row. Whereas dictionaries, you access them using their keys, arrays, you, uh, you're, they're kind of index-based. So you say, give me the first object, give me the second object, or give me the uh, third object, or the last or first objects. So um, arrays, or lists, as they're called in Python, uh, they're also very, very useful in Django, as you'll later see when we go into the backend development. And they're created using square brackets. So you can say, hello, for instance, in here, or with a single code that some people prefer. 1 to 100, and then a float value, for instance, in here. So here we created a list. So if we go ahead and create another list in here, so let's say ages, ages equal to this, 10, 20, and 30, or 20, 30, and 40, for instance. OK? Uh, actually, we want to create it with a, a square bracket. Otherwise, we're creating a map, kind of. So in here, we created the list. So you can see. And we have a list called ages, which contains the values of 20, 30, and 40. So if I say ages, give me the first value in there, you, you get the value of 20, because 20 was the first value. Now, indices or indexes in Python, as there are almost every other program language that I know about, at least, they're zero-based, meaning that the first item in the ages list starts at the index of zero. So you can see the index of zero gives you the value of 20. And index of one, it's not the first item, it's actually the second item, because one is one after zero. So just remember the indexes are zero based. So ages one will give you the value of 30, and ages two will give you the value of 40. Okay. Just like with dictionaries, you can also find values inside um, lists with an if statement. Uh, with if um, something in the list or if something um, not in the list. So if you go back to the ages example in here, we can say if 20 in ages, print yes, 20 exists. Okay, Just like that. And also, if you want to search for, for instance, the value of 50 in here, and if it's not in there, you can use if 50 not in, OK? Um, not in ages, print 50 is not there, OK? So it's the same syntax as you would use with a dictionary. Uh, if something in collection, if something not in collection is the same rule that applies for all collections. So in Python, which, which makes the language quite easy to understand as well. Now, as we saw, you can also, excuse me, you can also access values inside a list using their indexes. So if this is our list, you can say ages, give us the first item. Um, oops, the value of 20. Ages, give us the second item and give us the third item. OK, so this is how you would access uh, values inside the list using their indexes. And if you provide an index that doesn't exist, like the 11th item, you will get an error in here that says index error. So we'll talk more about like uh, handling exceptions later. So don't worry about that. Good stuff. Um, and if you're um, and if you're yeah accessing uh, invalid indexes inside a list as as you saw you'll get er an error index error which is kind of important actually to understand because if you see this anywhere inside your Django application or for instance just vanilla Python application then you know that you're accessing an invalid index from a collection okay now we saw the len function before this is a function that can get for instance the length of pretty much anything so if I say hello in here. It, it gives me the value of five because there are five characters in this uh, in this uh, string. And if we have uh, ages in here, 20, 30, and 40, if you want to get the length of that list, how many items are inside that list, you can say len of ages. 
then you get the value of three in here. So len is a very, very useful function uh, generally in Python if you want to get the length of pretty much anything. Okay, well, after we've talked about getting the length of a list, let's go ahead and talking about also slicing lists. Now, this is one of my favorite functionalities actually in Python, which is available in some other languages, but not really in the same full format as it is available in Python. Uh, there is a concept in Python called slicing for lists, and it's very, very useful. And the format, as you can see, is start, stop, and also steps. And you separate those uh, values with a colon. So let's say that we have a value in here. Let's say we have names, and we say is equal to foo, okay, bar, and bass. Good. And then let's say that we want to get the first two values out of uh, this list. So we say names, and then you start at the index of zero. And then you can say we want to, for instance, go to two. And then you get foo and bar in here. So you're saying that I want zero and one. I want to stop at two. OK. And also, you can, uh, you can basically also do um, steps. So if we say foo bar bass cox here, um, and then let's actually put it here. And then we, we can say names. We want to go from uh, index zero. And we want to go, uh, for instance, all the way to the end of the list. So I don't even have to specify the end. And I want to jump over every two values. So you can see it reads foo. And it says, OK, I have to go to the end of the list. So it goes all the four items, basically. It doesn't need a stop. And then you can say, OK, once you get to foo, jump over two values and it says okay i'm gonna go here so basically i read foo and then bar is um skipped and then bass so it's every two numbers it's not like that it's jumping over two values it's actually every two numbers or every two items in the list so this is just quick about um slicing in python there's so much you can do with slicing it's unbelievable you can like reverse a list you can jump over items from back of the list it's you can do loops and hoops with uh, basically a list slicing. And I suggest if you're if you're curious about slicing, please go ahead and read the official documentations about list, list slicing in Python because it's amazing what you can do with it. I'm not going to go too much into it. I just want to give you the idea of what list slicing is. So if you see something like this when later we starting to develop our Django application, the backend application, then you know at least what it is. So the format is important to remember. It's start, stop, and steps, OK, all with S's. Now, if you have a list and you want to count the number of, um, uh, count the occurrences, the, the number of occurrences of an item in that list, then you can basically use count in there. So let's say names uh, is equal to foo, OK? Actually, let's complete it like that. And let's add another foo to the end of this list. So if I say names, you can see that foo appears in here twice. So if you want to understand how many times foo appears in this list, then you can say names count. And then you can say foo in here. <clears throat> and then you get the value of two. OK, so that's how you can use the count um, uh, function on a list. All right. After we've talked about lists, let's talk a little bit also about sets. Sets are important because they, uh, they don't allow duplicates. So it's a unique collection of items. So in here, if you go back to our example of creating a list in here, we have a list of um, names in here, for instance, and foo is duplicated. So it's duplicated and it's uh, appearing twice in this list. However, if you change these square brackets to curly brackets in here, then you're creating a set. So the way a set is created is very similar to how you create a dictionary or a dict, is that it's with, uh, square, uh, with curly brackets. However, there are, there are no columns between the items. So in, inside, a, inside a dict, for instance, my uh, values, then you could say uh, this. You could say the key is one and the value is one. And the, the keys and values are separated with a column. However, if you look at the format for creating a set, it is with a curly bracket exactly as it is with a dict. However, there are no columns in between. It's just um, commas in there. Okay. So uh, if we then say names uh, in here, you can see it says bar, bass, foo, and cux here. So uh, foo is not appearing twice. Though we at the declaration of names, 
<clears throat> the names variable, excuse me, we specified foo twice. However, at the end, foo is appearing only once. And that's exactly what maps and um, what um, sets are good for in that um, they allow you to uh, remove duplicates from a collection. And the way to create them is, as you can see, is with a curly bracket and then your values and their, the values are separated with commas, okay? If you want to find values inside a set, you can also use the exact same um, syntax as we've been using for dictionaries and also for lists. So it's that you say if something in set. So we say if foo in names print it is there. Okay. You can see then it says it is there. And we say this is our set just so we don't forget. Okay. If uh, foo as a capital, okay, not in names. And we say print as expected. Okay, so you can see that it cannot find foo in uh, in that names set because foo is spelled in here as uh, all caps. All right, so. This format is nothing special at the moment for you because you've already seen that this format of if something in or if something not in collection works with all the collections with lists, sets, and dicts. So is not a surprise at this point. You can also iterate over a, uh, a set as you would also be able to iterate over, over a list. We're going to talk about iterations actually with about loops soon, but just so you know, uh, if we have you names in here written like this, you can say for name in names, and then you can say print name, okay? And you can see that you're getting all your values printed to the screen. So this is a very simple way of iterating over values inside a set. And it also works with lists. So if we change this to a list here, okay? And if I say for name in names, print name, you can see it works exactly the same way. Okay, and also it kind of works with dictionaries as well. So if you say for actually values is equal to, uh, if you say a dictionary, let's say my values equal to. So this is our dictionary with the keys and values. You can say for <clears throat> uh, values or value in my values, print value, okay? You can see you get your keys, okay? So this format of for something in collection works with all collections, dicts, uh, maps, and sets. Um, sorry, dicts, <laughs> lists, and sets, okay? But we're gonna talk about loops soon. So uh, we will be using collections quite a lot later on when we start doing our backend development. So it is quite important that you actually uh, learn as much as you can about collections, or at least the basics of collections. If, you, if you're if you familiar with some other programming languages from before, you know basically the uh, basics of uh, collections, or maybe you're actually a pro at it, then you don't have to spend so much time learning that in Python. But it's still important to understand the syntax for it and looping over items in a collection, getting the keys and values, because the functions in, in Python standard library for working with collections are probably different from what you're used to. For instance, if you're a Rust developer or even a JavaScript developer, Python functions might be different. And even the operators that work on collections, they're most definitely a little bit different from the language that you're used to. So since collections are so important, and also when it comes to Django, they're so important, it's very, very essential that you learn the basics of them in Python. So it's not just enough that you know the basics of collections generally, it's just you, you need to understand how they work in Python as well, okay? Great stuff, that's, that's enough about collections. Now let's talk quickly just a, a little bit about loops because we can't move on uh, with the rest of the uh, stuff I've prepared for you in this chapter uh, without talking about uh, loops. So loops in Python are very, very simple usually <clears throat> excuse me, and loops allow you to go over a collection of things. So if you have a dict, a, a list, or a set, and you want to iterate over the items in those collections, then you're, you're going to use the syntax that you can see at the bottom of the screen for variable in collection. Okay, and we're going to see an example uh, of that soon, actually. So let's go ahead and create a simple collection and loop through it. So 
here we're going to create a variable called values and, and we're going to make a list out of that and we're going to put the items one two three in there so let's say values is equal to one two three as you can see in here okay and if i want to loop through the items in this collection which is a list i can just say for value mean values okay and then i can say print value then I can execute this code and you can see the values one, two, three are being printed to the screen. So this is nothing revolutionary or nothing difficult really to understand. You can also loop through ranges. So if you want to, for instance, go, uh, if, you're, if you're used to simple loops from other languages that you say for something, uh, start from the index of zero and go to index of 10, for instance, um, then you can also do that in Python, but you have to create a range for it. So you can say, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, you can say four, a value in range 10, for instance, and then you can say print value, okay? Then you're getting zero all the way to an inclusive of nine being printed to the screen. So this is also a simple way of creating a loop in Python. Now, if you are uh, if you want to loop through items um, in a collection, but at the same time, you want the index of that item in the collection, and then you can use enumerate, as you can see at the bottom of the screen. So uh, if in here we say uh, names are foo bar baz okay so this is uh, this is uh, basically a list as you can see if you want to iterate through the names in that names variable but at the same time get the index then you can use the enumerate function so let's go ahead and say for and none uh, and name in enumerate values and i think actually we didn't say values we said names right yeah so for <clears throat> num uh, and let's say in here, instead of values, we say names, all right? And then we say print num and then print name, all right? So in here, you can see the values are being printed to the screen. So num is the index of the item that we're enumerating. So in, at index of zero, there is a value of foo. At index of one, there is a value of bar, et cetera, et cetera. So remember this syntax of in here, you're pretty much creating a tuple of a number and a, or the index and a name, and then using the function enumerate, then you're basically going through the items in names collection with their indexes. So it's quite useful, OK? So we've talked quite uh, um, a bit about loops. They're not magical. They're very useful, though. But I don't think there's so much point in going too deep into loops because you will get them as we work with Python and Django later. So um, just so you understand the basics of what loops are and what they're useful. Uh, for. So now that we've talked a little bit about loops, let's go ahead and talk about um, object-oriented programming, because that's also very, very useful in Django later, as you'll, as you'll see. So object-oriented programming, or OOP, as it's sometimes also written, um, is one of the fundamentals uh, of um, Django development at this point, because Django is very, very object oriented. So you can do subclassing, for instance, you can, you can do um, abstract classes and functions, encapsulation, all of that. So I think it's important that we talk a little bit, a little bit about the basics of object oriented programming in this chapter. <clears throat> so we before we get started with Django, you're familiar with the concepts, okay? So let's. There are four rules in object-oriented programming. So I don't want to be. I don't want to be cliche, but I think when it comes to object-oriented programming, we have to actually talk about the concepts in, a, not in order, but at least the four basic pillars of object-oriented programming as they are in the book, so to say. Okay. So let's talk about the first concept. The first concept is abstraction, and you can see in here is the art of exposing only the necessary information. Okay. Now. Abstraction is kind of difficult to explain abstraction without showing you an example. So I think it's actually good that we have a look at an example. Abstraction in Python is done with ABC, which is abstract base class. So ABC is a class that you will need to subclass in your classes in order to create an abstract class. I said class way too many times maybe, but that's that's the only way I can explain it. And I think it would be really good to have a look at an example. So let's go in here and there is a module in Python called ABC. So we say from ABC, okay, import abstract method and the ABC class itself. So abstract method, as you'll soon see, is going to be used as a decorator for functions or methods that we're going to create in our, in our own classes. And ABC itself is the abstract class or our abstract base class. 
don't worry if it's a little bit uh, confusing at the moment. You'll soon see how we're going to use it. So let's go ahead and create a car class in here, OK? And we're going to say our car class. Let's go in here. Let me bring the title up as well. And we're going to say our car class is subclassing ABC. If you see something like this in Python or Django, then you know that the class that is being created in here is actually, uh, or the class that is being written in here is actually an abstract base class, OK? Kind of. Or at least it's an abstract class, you can say, all right? So now we're creating an abstract class. And you, you'd probably be asking, what is an abstract class? Well, an abstract class is usually a class that you're not going to um, you're not going to instantiate or create an instance of. Some other classes that we've written before, for instance, the person class, if you remember from before, that had a first name, a last name, and a full name function, that class could be instantiated. However, if you have an abstract class, you're not going to create an instance of it directly. You can't actually do that. So abstraction in object-oriented programming is the art of uh, exposing only the necessary information, meaning that, for instance, you can have a class uh, called car, and this car class is going to have some information in it, but it's not going to be exposed to anyone because you can't instantiate that class. And then later, we're going to go and subclass this um, abstract class. And then in that subclass, we're going to expose the necessary information. So that's that's the art of abstraction and object-oriented programming. Okay, So now we've created our abstract class in here, which is called car. And then we're going to go ahead and create a constructor for it. So as you can see, we're going to add speed and year um, to uh, the constructor in here. So let's say uh, def init um, self, if I can spell self, and we're going to have speed and year, OK? So we have the speed and year in here. And um, what we're going to do then is that we're going to store this information inside uh, our properties. So let's go in here and say, uh, for instance, self.speed is speed. And then we're going to say self.year is year as well. OK? So let's go ahead then inside the same class, define two functions in here, which are not abstract functions. And they're called start and stop. And you can see in here, an abstract class can also include non-abstract functions. And what this really means is abstract functions uh, or methods, they, um, they basically need to be implemented in subclasses, as you'll soon see. However, non-abstract functions or methods in an abstract class, they can have um, they can have logic in them and they can be subclassed by another class and reused. So you'll actually see soon what I mean because I have prepared this example specifically for this. So let's create a function in here and call it start. And we take self in here, OK? Then uh, let's go in here and say print. And we say car is starting. And then we create another non-abstract function in here. We call it stop, OK? And we say print, car is stopping. All right, so this is this is quite fine. Then let's go ahead in here and define an abstract function or abstract method for our abstract class of car. So let's go in here and then uh, prefix this abstract function with our abstract method, um, uh, which we've imported in here. OK, so let's say abstract method in here with an at sign. All right. And I'm going to do some resizing in here so you see my screen better. Put it here like this, perhaps so that the title at the bottom of the screen doesn't block you, OK? So then we have the ab abstract method in here, and we're going to call it def. Uh, and then this is going to be drive. And it's going to take self in here, OK? And then in this abstract method, we're going to say print um, car is driving, like this, all right? That's it, really, OK? So. After we've done this, I'm going to press the Enter button in here. And then if I type car, you can see that it is a class that is available now inside the main module. All right. However, if we want to go ahead and create an instance of this car, so let's say C or car is equal to an instance of car, you'll see that you get an error, which is a type error. And it says can't instantiate abstract class car with abstract method drive. So what happened in here, since car is an abstract class and it has an abstract method in it, you cannot create an instance of it. So what happens if we go back in here and remove this abstract method from here, OK? 
and just execute this code. And then we say car is an instance of car. You'll see it says type error, and it says car in it missing two required positional arguments, speed and year, okay? So let's go in here and say speed is 100 and year is 2022 or 23. And now I can actually create an instance of car, though it's coming from the ABC or abstract base class. So what's important to understand here is that you can instantiate an abstract class as long as it doesn't have abstract methods in Python. But since our implementation of car, initially at least, let's see if we can create it here. Uh, here, it had an abstract method declaration in here. You cannot then create an instance of that car class directly. Okay, so boom. And then we say car is car, 100. And it says typer can't instantiate an abstract class car with abstract method drive. So it understands that drive is an abstract method that needs to be subclassed and recreated in a subclass as we'll soon actually do. All right. So let me bring uh, the next title in here. So we're going to go ahead and create a concrete implementation of car and we're going to call it Tesla. So let's say we have a Tesla car in here and it's coming from the car abstract class. Okay. So that's, that's the definition of Tesla so far. So we're going to go ahead and add the constructor for uh, Tesla in here, OK? And we're going to call super in there. Um, so let's go ahead and say def init. And we're going to say self, speed, year, and model. So speed and year were actually inside the, um, inside the car class, if you remember. So inside the initializer of the uh, car class, we have the speed and the year. But model is something that Tesla is adding to the car class. So now we're going to go ahead and actually call super um, and or, or our super class, which is car, to store the speed and year. And then we're going to store model locally. And in here, we need to be aware that the car class already has an init function defined. So if you want to call that init function in here so that it can store the speed and the year in the car abstract class, then we should say super in here, as you can see with parentheses. Then we're going to call the init function of super and then pass the speed and the year to that super. Okay. And then since car itself doesn't have a storage for the model, and that model is actually a new parameter being passed only to Tesla classes, then we need to store that privately ourselves. So let's go in here and say this, or sorry, self underscore underscore model is model. Okay. So that's really good. Now we're going to go ahead also and define the, um, define the drive function for our Tesla class. Because if you remember in car, which was an ABC class or an abstract base class um, subclass, we had an abstract method uh, called drive. And that drive abstract method was the sole reason we couldn't instantiate uh, the car class. What an abstract method does then is that every subclass of that car class will need to redefine that drive function because without redefining that drive function, you can't actually create an instance of that class. So let's go ahead and now that we've created the Tesla class, let's go ahead and say, let me clear this. And we say uh, Tesla is a new instance of Tesla and the speed is going to be 100 year 2023. And the model is, let's say, model X. OK, you can see now you're actually getting the same error. Maybe you can't see it. I'll bring it up. It says you can't instantiate it because there still is an abstract function in Tesla called drive. Since Tesla didn't override, um, sorry, it didn't, it didn't recreate that function, basically, then we're stuck with the same error. So let's go back to the definition of Tesla in here. And let's say we now have a def drive in here, OK? We say print, uh, Tesla is driving, just like that, all right? So now that we've done that, let's go ahead and um, instantiate uh, Tesla as we wanted to before, like this. And then I can actually type Tesla, and you can see that we're getting Tesla printed to the screen. So Tesla now has uh, has basically recreated the drive uh, function. So it's not an abstract method anymore, um, or the drive method. So it's not abstract anymore. Hence, you can create an instance of Tesla. So uh, abstraction is the art of hiding unnecessary details. And it's 
available in all languages that has that have support for OOP. Now, I completely understand that you may not fully get abstract uh, functions or abstract methods and abstract classes right now, but just know that abstraction is when you are creating, for instance, um, an abstract class, and then you're putting details and information in there, but the programmers cannot create an instance of that class. Hence, you're hiding the information that is placed in that class and the logic that is placed in that class. So in order to be able to use that abstract uh, class or abstract methods, you need to create a subclass. And then through that process of creating a subclass of an abstract class, then you're only exposing necessary information to whoever is creating an instance of that subclass that you've created. It's a little, it's a little bit difficult to understand, I, I, I know. But the more you use abstract uh, classes and abstract uh, methods, you'll get the concept. Now, I have to be honest, abstraction is something that is used quite often, actually, without you knowing about it in Django. But in my experience, I haven't had to use abstraction with abstract classes and abstract functions and methods so much in Django. So it's a good thing to know about just so that you know about object-oriented programming. But in my experience, I haven't had to actually use ABC in Django at all in my years of working with Django. So just so you have all the information available, OK? So let's now talk about, now that we talked about um, abstraction, let's talk about the second rule of object-oriented programming. And that is encapsulation. And that's protecting internal data, as you'll soon see how that works. Let's go ahead and define a class in here. So let's say class person, OK? Then let's go ahead and save the name of that person inside the init function. OK, so let's say def init. And then we're going to say self and then name in here. OK, so what we're going to do is to say self dot underscore underscore name is equal to name. And this is a convention used in Python by creating underscore underscore uh, of a property. You're basically making that property private to this class. So if I go in here and say p is equal to person, and then let's pass a name of foobar in here, OK? And you can say p name. You can see that you get an attribute error. Person object has no attributes name because it's private to this class, all right? Let's go back to the person class in here. So we have it in front of us. So uh, I actually ran ahead a little bit of myself. So this is uh, supposed to be done right now, not before. So we can't use name because it's, of course, it's uh, it's a private property, OK? now. Now that you have this private property in here, you may want to expose it to the outside world. So you may, for instance, want people to read from it and also write to it. However, using abstraction, uh, sorry, uh, using encapsulation, you can basically add some logic to the reading and writing of this property from the outside world. And that's, that's one of the beauties of object-oriented programming as well. So uh, let's go ahead in here and say, that we can now add a getter to our class. So if you go back in here, let's say that we want the outside world to be able to read from this property. How do we do that? The way to do that is that you prefix your um, property with the word at sign property in here, OK? And then we say this is a property. And it's a function called name. And we have self available in here, OK? Then we can say return self dot underscore underscore name, OK? So if you go back to create an instance of our person, let's see, and then I can say p.name. OK, you can see now that we're getting foobar printed to the screen. So this is a very simple way of creating a getter for our property. So it has name. And also, since now name is a function, so it is being used as a getter, then this being a function, you can actually have more logic in here. So you can say, for instance, print getting the name for you. Okay, and then you can place it there. Let's actually remove this line and create an instance of person in here. And then we can say p.name. You can see that we have our extra logic also being executed for us. So, um, so that's how you would create a simple getter for the name private property. What happens then if you want to also create a setter? So uh, if you go back in here, we have p, which is an instance of person. If I say p name is foobar, we'll see that we'll get an error in here because it says that the um, name is a property that cannot be set. 
And the reason for that is if you go back to the definition of person class in here, you'll see that uh, we only have a property getter. So we're only returning the value of name. We're not allowing you to set the value of name, okay? Also, let's remove this line in here. So how do we go about letting the programmer who's using our class to actually set the value of name? And we do that with, um, in here, as you can see, it's the name of our property, which happens just to be name. And then you say setter, okay? And then you say definition of uh, name. And then you say self and then a new value. All right, so this is how you would create a setter with the at sign name of your property, which happens to be name dot setter. Okay, so this is always how you would create a setter for your properties. Okay, then what we can't do in here, we can have extra logic in here. So we say if new value is equal to foo, okay, then we say uh, raise value error, and we say raise value error. This is this is not acceptable. All right, and we say otherwise. Uh, otherwise, self dot name is equal to new value. So easy peasy. All right. So if you have a look at this code, we're creating a setter. We're saying that every value except for foo is allowed. If you pass us the foo value, then we're gonna raise an exception. Now we haven't talked about exceptions, but just know that this is a way. It raises a keyword in Python that allows you to create an exception or an error. Other, in other, other words. So it creates an error of type value error, and this is the message that we're passing to that exception. So let's go ahead and create an instance of this person. So if I can find it, foobar, as you can see. And now if I say p.name, it's foobar. If I say p.name is foo, oops, p.name is equal to foo, we can see that we're getting an exception of type value error. If I bring it up so you see it better as well, it says this is not acceptable. Okay, but if I say p that name is foo with a capital uh, with capital letters, we can see that I can assign that and I can actually read that value. Okay, so uh, we're basically creating. Uh, I think I've run ahead of myself a little bit again because I didn't bring the title for as you can see at the bottom of the screen. But you can create an instance of that person. You can see in here. Okay. Uh, and then you can basically assign values to name, etc., as you've already seen. So I don't have to repeat myself again. Encapsulation really in object-oriented programming is all about uh, protecting data. As you just saw, we have a property called underscore underscore name, and that property is protected uh, in, in that it is private to the class, but it's also being exposed to the outside world using setters and getters. Uh, the getter is just working fine without any problems, just returning the data for that property. However, when it comes to the setter, we're protecting the inter integrity of the name property by preventing you, for instance, um, from entering the value of foo for that property. So that's how encapsulation basically works. You're, you're hiding details of your implementation so that uh, the outside world cannot mess with that data. So you can have actually business logic in your classes without anyone actually really knowing about it. So enough about encapsulation. Let's now talk a little bit about the third concept in object-oriented programming, and that is inheritance. Now, inheritance, thankfully, is something that we've been doing just a few times when we, for instance, looked at the car uh, abstract class, and also we subclassed it using the Tesla class that was inheritance. Okay, and inheritance really is the concept of reusing um, data in a hierarchy. So you may be familiar with it, but I can't make that assumption. So let's have a look at this. Okay, so let's go ahead. <clears throat> excuse me. So let's go ahead in here and create a car class. So we're going to say class car. Okay, very simple. There's no um, super classes in here. Then we're going to go ahead and add a start function to it. So let's say def start. Okay. And in here, we're going to say print <clears throat> car is starting just like that. All right. Now that this is done, let's go ahead and create another class that subclasses the car class. So we're going to say class Tesla comes from car. All right. So this is how you subclass in Python. So let's go ahead and override the um, start function, as you can see in here. So I'm going to say start. All right. And then in here, we want to say super. And then we're going to say start as well. All right. As you can see at the bottom of the screen. So this is 
us basically using um, uh, using inheritance. So we're saying the Tesla class comes from the car class, and it has the same exact function as the car uh, car class that's called start. And in the start function, all we're doing is just that we're calling our super class, which is the car class, saying, okay, do your thing instead. So we're saying the start class, sorry, the start function or method in here has no other work than calling super. Okay. And this is kind of a useless um, method at the moment because the default implementation or the default way that Python works with inheritance is that you don't actually have to do this. So uh, for instance, let's actually skip this. Okay. And we just say pass. And then I say T is Tesla. And then I say T drive. Uh, oops, object has an attribute drive. Or oh, sorry, start. T dot uh, start. You can see it says car is starting. So because car already had the implementation of start. Okay. However, we can go in, into your Tesla class and say uh, def start. And in here, you can say print Tesla is starting. And then at the same time, you can say super dot uh, start. So let's see how this works. Okay. So uh, let's go ahead and say T is a Tesla. And then we say T dot start. You can now see that the first statement printed to the screen um, is Tesla is starting. And then the second one is car is starting. So you have access to basically the logic that comes in your super class. That's what I'm trying to say in here. So. Tesla came from the car class, and car class can have its own logic, and Tesla can actually take advantage of the logic inside the car class, okay? So inheritance is usually applicable to classes, and I mean, you could also argue that enums in Python are classes, and you can sometimes actually inherit data in an enum, but it's not so often uh, done. Uh, but when it comes to classes, when we talk about inheritance, we're pretty much almost always talking about classes, just so you know, in Python, okay? So that was the third rule in object-oriented programming. Now let's talk about polymorphism. And you can see it's the same entity taking many forms. Polymorphism is a little bit strange to talk about sometimes, and especially in Python. Um, in some other programming languages, like C++, is a little bit more explicit what polymorphism actually is. But in Python, when it comes to implementing polymorphism, it can get a little bit strange. And I'll show you actually why. So actually, to uh, explain what polymorphism is, it's good to have a look at the len, len function. So in here, I can say foo. I can also len of one, two, three. I can say len of, for instance, a, a uh, set, one, two, three. And I can also say a len of dictionary uh, of with the keys of one, uh, one in here, for instance. Okay. So what happening here is that there is just one function called len, and um, it, it, it is allowing me to pass a string. It's allowing me to pass a list, a set, and a dict. And in that way, you could say the len function is polymorphic. So it is, it is basically one of the absolute beautiful examples of polymorphism is that is one function uh, name but it is allowing you to pass pretty much any data you want to it. So if we say, for instance, uh, len of one, we get an error saying typer. But if you say len of any collection, so one, two, three, for instance, then you can pass data to it. So uh, len is an, a good example of what polymorphism actually means. It's one, um, it's one interface, it's one function that you have to learn about, but it, it is able to perform many different types of work on different objects and data types, OK? So what you can do is that you can create a very simple polymorphic function also in, function, in Python by not specifying the data type of the incoming value. So let's go in here and say def print value, <clears throat> OK? And then we say value. And then you can just say um, print type of value. All right, so it's very, very simple. So now you can say print value 1. You can say print value. And then one, two, three. And you can say print value of a set, for instance, one, two, three. <clears throat> so this is a very simple example of a polymorphic function also in Python. And for those of you who are familiar with JavaScript, this may not be a huge surprise because you're basically providing no data type for the value that is being sent to this print value function. However, if you're working with TypeScript, 
you're probably a little bit more wary of, okay, what data type is this value coming into this function? And uh, that what can I actually do with that value? However, in Python, it's also very, very, very uh, popular not to specify data types. And this is something historic for Python, and it's also historic for Django. Data types are available in Python, but they're usually not specified. And when you get to the backend development using Django, then later, you'll see that most of the times we don't actually define the data types of values that or arguments that are being passed to functions. And that's just how it is in Python, OK? Now, Django uses uh, object-oriented programming quite a lot. Um, and I think this is one of the reasons I also want to talk about object-oriented programming in this uh, chapter. And um, I think it's very important that you bring up IPython or your favorite editor or uh, whatever you want to use, an, an ID or whatever it is. Go through the basics of Python that we went through in this uh, chapter yourself. Uh, so don't just watch the content. Uh, and I really suggest that you sit yourself, also experiment with um, uh, hopefully IPython, because I think IPython is like the easiest way of actually sitting and learning about Python because it's a REPL. You can just easily type commands and get immediate feedback. Okay. So please go ahead and play with the at least uh, the basics of Python that we talked about and also object oriented program because they're very, very useful later when we get to our backend development using Django. So I really hope that you enjoyed this chapter. And if you have any questions, please let me know in the descriptions, uh, sorry, in the comments at the bottom of this video. And uh, I hope to see you in the next chapter.